Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a couple of weeks since Osiris Rex reached into the heart of Bennu and pulled out a handful of ancient asteroid material. It's now packaged away in the return capsule and it'll be coming back to Earth in a few years' time. The pictures of this are amazing and many people, including scientists working on the project, were surprised at how fragile this asteroid appears to be. It's very likely that underneath the regolith on the surface that Bennu is just a pile of rubble held together weakly by the force of gravity. Bennu has even been observed to be spitting off small bits of rock, probably propelled by the vaporization of volatile materials like water, ammonia or carbon dioxide as the sun heats the surface. In fact, it's, it's believed that rubble pile are a surprisingly common type of asteroid. Take a look at Ryugu, which was the other asteroid recently visited for a sample mission. Hayabusa 2 took a look at this, and uh, Ryugu looks surprisingly similar to Bennu. It's got this similar diamond shape, and it's believed that this shape is because the rotation of the asteroid causes rocks on the surface that are unstable to roll towards the equator preferentially. So anyway, many comments on my video at Bennu looked at this cloud of debris and they said, huh, I thought asteroids were dangerous, but if this hit the Earth, it would just fall apart and the Earth would be unaffected. And you know, Bennu actually has a much higher chance of hitting Earth in centuries to come than most asteroids we know of. But the idea that a weak pile of gravel does not present any threat is just wrong. No matter how weak the material, what ultimately matters is the kinetic energy of the object. And that doesn't care about the internal strength of the material. And this is the same kind of thinking that had people looking at video of a piece of foam hitting the wing on the Space Shuttle Columbia and concluding that there was no danger to the spacecraft. So, for an object uh, like an asteroid entering the atmosphere at a specific speed, one ton of solid iron has the same kinetic energy as one ton of loose gravel. Uh, a space rock moving at 20 kilometers per second, by the way, has about 50 times the energy of the equivalent mass of TNT. But what will differ is how that energy is converted into other forms as it descends through the atmosphere from space. So a solid chunk of meteoritic iron will be dense and strong. Iron has a density of about like seven tons per cubic meter or something. It'll hit the atmosphere and just punch straight through all the way down. Sure, it'll create a superheated uh, channel through the atmosphere, heating it to a luminous plasma as it converts its kinetic energy to heat. Uh, but yeah, meteorite crater in Arizona was very likely a 50 maybe meter chunk of iron that just pierced through the atmosphere, hit the ground with enough velocity, and it blew a hole, you know, half a mile wide, you know, eight, 800 meters wide in the ground. But for rocky asteroids with cracks and imperfections, those break up as they start moving through the atmosphere. So there's all this dynamic pressure that builds up at the front of the asteroid. And this pressure, just the, wind, the airflow, can just strip material off the surface, either at the front or on the edges. But on top of this, as it's doing this, it's being slowed down. And the deceleration is like putting you know, a chunk of rock on a surface. The force of gravity will cause a pile of dirt to collapse into a pile. And the same thing happens when you're decelerating a loosely bound pile of rubble. So you can imagine that as this happens, the spherical cross-section of the object starts to flatten out and pancake, and this increases the cross-section of it. And guess what? Since the deceleration increases as the cross-section increases, the whole process can actually quickly feed back on itself as an asteroid crushes itself into fragments against the force of the atmosphere and releases a lot of energy very quickly. It's not really an explosion, but the large amount of energy released is called an airburst, and it can be a pretty good analogue to an atomic explosion. So a weak asteroid will release more of its energy into the atmosphere on the way down and may not even reach the ground before breaking up, but it will still release all the energy that it brought in. And the best example of this is the Chelyabinsk meteor in 2013, which probably massed about 13,000 tons and was maybe 20 meters in diameter before it entered the atmosphere at about 9.20 a.m. local time and exploded at an altitude of about 30 kilometers. 
The blast injured almost a thousand people and damaged maybe 2,000 buildings, mostly by shattering windows and damaging doors and uh, roofs. There was a fairly sizable fragment of this actually recovered from a nearby lake. It wasn't a, you know, a complete rubble pile, but it did break up on the way down. So there's various attempts to model how the energy is released from asteroids depending upon their physical strength. And generally, the stronger the asteroid is, the closer it gets to the ground and the more damage it can cause. But larger asteroids take longer to get completely disrupted. Even with no internal strength, the fact is that there's a finite amount of atmosphere between space and the ground. Uh, you know, when we talk about atmospheric pressures, in America, they say 15 pounds per square inch, which means that for every square inch of the Earth's surface, there's about 15 pounds of air sitting above it between the ground and space. In metric, we say it's about 100 um, you know, pascals, which corresponds to about 10 tons per square meter. Uh, so yeah, an asteroid coming straight down from space for every one meter of cross-section will encounter 10 tons of air. Um, and, you know, depending upon the angle, that will change. If it comes down at 45 degrees, that's about 14 tons per square meter. 30 degrees, it's about 20. So, if you take the cross-section of Bennu from one side to the other, this is a 500 meter asteroid. And that means that, you know, in the middle, the cross-sectional density um, of, you know, the asteroid's bulk density is about 1.26 tons per cubic meter. So yeah, cross-section every square meter is about 600 tons of rubble and they aren't going to be stopped by 10 or 20 tons of atmosphere on the way down. So yeah, if Bennu encountered the Earth, it would disintegrate. It would spread a lot of energy as it went through the atmosphere, but it would make it all the way to the surface and it would hit at about 12.9 kilometers per second and release energy equivalent to maybe 1400 megatons of TNT, right? Or 1.4 gigatons, right? The crater from this would be about five kilometers across, about half a kilometer deep, and anything nearby is completely obliterated. Even out to like 50 kilometers, most buildings will collapse due to the uh, pressure wave. At 100 kilometers, you're shattering windows and damaging roofs, and even out to 200 kilometers, windows are getting shattered. If it hits the ocean, by the way, there's less buildings, but there's also the prospect of a tsunami that will grow out and can potentially devastate coastlines thousands of miles away. So Bennu, if it did hit, it isn't a planet killer like we see in Hollywood movies. It's a localized event that can lay waste to large areas. It would leave a significant effect on the Earth's climate for a few years, following, you know, as dust in the atmosphere would help to form clouds. It would be a natural disaster bigger than any in recorded history, but it's not going to wipe out the human race. While Bennu does come close to the Earth every uh, six years or so, it's actually hard to tell in the long term what chances Bennu has of colliding with the Earth. We can calculate its orbit forwards in time, and we can see that in 2060 it will come within 0.005 AU of the Earth. That's about twice the distance to the Moon. This is close enough that the gravity of the Earth will have an effect on the future orbit. And this effect is very sensitive to the configuration, how close it actually is. So any errors in the measurement now will be amplified by this close encounter in 2060. So yeah, depending upon what happens, the close encounter in 2060 sets it up for another close approach in 2135. And this is actually much closer. The nominal distance is about 0.02 AU, which is inside the orbit of the Moon. Uh, but it could be as close as 100,000 kilometers, but there's no chance it will hit the Earth. But if it hits this close encounter in the right place at the right time, the Earth's gravity will twist its orbit just right so that it hits the Earth in future encounters. There are tiny keyholes in the close approach configurations, which if Bennu passes through them, it will, it will impact the Earth. And the size of these keyholes, by the way, is about 50 kilometers. And, you know, the error bars are hundreds of thousands of kilometers. One keyhole corresponds to about a 1 in 24,000 chance of an impact in 2175. There's another which is a 1 in 11,000 chance of 2196. When you add them all up, you get something like a you know, 1 in 2700 chance of an impact overall. We actually know the orbit of Bennu much better than any other asteroid because we've had a spacecraft sitting next to it providing very accurate range and velocity data. 
Uh, but at the same time, it's a small asteroid and its orbit is changing due to effects like the sun. Um, the sun heats the surface and then as that surface rotates onto the night side, it re-emits that heat in infrared and that actually will provide a radiation pressure that changes the orbit. Um, and also, hey, we just poked that asteroid with a spacecraft, right? The, all these little changes will, will affect the orbit over time. So while it's unlikely to impact in the future, it's not out of the question. And as time goes on and we get more data, the odds will become clearer. If we did need to do something about a potential impact and give it, we could give it a push to change the orbit, but since it's so fragile, this would be a delicate process. But you know, we already know how we would deal with that. We can do things like use the gravity tractor, which is a spacecraft that flies information with the asteroid and uses the gravity of the one ton spacecraft to move an 80 million ton asteroid. And if you think about it, if we moved the asteroid before the 2135 encounter, we'd only need to move it by you know, 50 kilometers, the size of one of these keyholes. OSIRIS-REx, when it was performing the sampling, it exerted a force of less than 70 newtons. Uh, Bennu's about 80 million tons, and that would have changed the speed by nanometers per second. Also, when um, OSIRIS-REx performed the back-off maneuver, it had to fire its thrusters and those hit the surface and those also pushed it. So overall, I think this has changed the orbit of Bennu by less than one meter per year. This is not something we can measure from the ground, but it does mean that by 2135, it'll probably be well over 100 meters away from where it would have been if we hadn't performed this. And it'll actually be more than that because of course there's the 2060 encounter. So without even trying, we've actually changed things. And if it became necessary, it's within our power to do this with the intention of changing the future and saving the Earth. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.